a special meeting of the Fayette County School Corporation Board of School Trustees. The meeting will come to order. <laughs> will you join me in a pledge of allegiance to our flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First thing on our agenda, we now need to have a motion to approve the agenda as submitted. Mr. President. Yes, Mr. Hilton. I move to approve the agenda as submitted. Do I hear a second? Second. Mr. Jones. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And the motion carries. All right, moving into the action item. Uh, First is a personnel report, uh, Dr. Bayer. Thank you, Mr. Burchett, Dr. Hodges, members of the board. Um, following an extensive search and comprehensive interview process to select a replacement for Debbie Williams, retiring Eastview principal, we have a candidate for your consideration. The process involved 17 candidates applying for the position. Uh, seven were interviewed, including five internal candidates. Before I provide the background on our candidate, I would like to <coughs> personally thank the interview team that was so instrumental in selecting the three finalists, those members were Lori Savoy, board member, Kim Casaro, Maplewood Elementary principal, staff members at Eastview, Joy Becker, Brenda Jones, Melissa Crow, Jennifer Cooley, uh, Doug Keller, and parent Jessica Morris, along with Dr. Kathy Rieke. We appreciate their help and, and their work. They did a fine job and really grew with the process. I was impressed with their work. I would ask the board's consideration this evening, Mr. James Small, as an ex-principal of Eastview Elementary. Mr. Small is a 2001 graduate of Indiana University East, where he received his Bachelor of Science degree in elementary education. In 2004, Mr. Small completed the requirements in earning his master's degree in special education from Indiana University in Bloomington. He earned his Director of Special Education license in 2007. His teaching career began in 2001 in Union County as a special education teacher. Then he transferred to Fayette County Schools in 2006 and has been employed since that time, initially as a special education teacher at Everton, then most recently as a sixth grade teacher at Fayette Central Elementary. In 2013, he was awarded the Indiana University Armstrong Teacher Educator Award, where he has participated in panel discussions focused on teacher evaluation procedures and classroom assessments. He also has worked with undergraduate elementary and secondary pre-service teachers focusing on classroom management, balanced literacy, and technology. His greatest asset is his experience in a variety of settings and always has been successful at leading by example. Additionally, he has been outstanding, he has outstanding rapport with students, staff, and his supervisors. He's always looking to meet the needs of students, thinking continuously of improvement. Mr. Small is married, has three children, I believe he has a guest with him tonight as well. He'll be introduced in a moment. The Fayette County School Corporation is extremely pleased then to recommend to you Mr. James Small to lead the students, staff, and Eastview Elementary into the 2014-2015 school year and beyond. After your consideration tonight, Mr. Burchett. Thank you, Dr. Bayer. You've heard Dr. Bayer's report. Uh, do I hear a motion uh, to accept his personal report, which be the hiring of James Small as principal. I'll make a motion. Okay, Mr. I'll Spurlock. A motion. Okay. All right. The motion has been made and second. Are there any questions or discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And the motion carries. Congratulations, Mr. Mr. Small. Mr. Small, if you'd like to come forward and say a few words, we appreciate your. <laughs> okay, this is where I'm not supposed to be nervous. That's right. <laughs> um, you know, I am deeply honored to be entrusted with such an important position. You know, I, you know, as I considered looking into this position, I really tried to do a little research, and one of the things that drew me to Eastview was the fact that you know, the staff the teachers, the students' families, the students and their families, really makes Eastview a, as a school family. And I really look forward to becoming part of that family. Um, you know, it's bittersweet for me, though. 
I absolutely love teaching. I love what I do. Um, I love working with students every day, and I know that I'll miss my miss my kids. But I um, I teach sixth grade, and every year they move on to middle school, and so I guess this is my time to move on. Um, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't say a few thank yous. Um, first, my family, my wife Jennifer. Um, she gives me way more support than I probably deserve. <laughs> um, you know, the school board, I'd like to thank, thank everyone for, for accepting this. Um, you know, the administration has just provided me really with so much support and confidence, and, you know, it's really helped me along the way. Um, my principal, Kay Raleigh, was not able to be here tonight, but my former principal, Brian Jennings, is here. And both, both of these people have impacted my career a lot. They are two of the best in the state, in my opinion. And I really appreciate the fact that they've supported me and that I've been able to learn from them. Um, my coworkers at Faya Central, they're tremendous people to work with. And I appreciate their support. I really appreciate my students and their families. You know, I think I've learned as much from them as they've learned from me. And finally, um, Debbie Williams. I've had the opportunity to work with Debbie on several occasions. And each time I've been really impressed with her professionalism, with her dedication to her staff. And, you know, I know she'll be sorely missed and there's no way I'll fill her shoes, but I'll absolutely do my best to not mess it all up. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, thank you for your hard work. Um, thank you for leaving Eastview in such a good position for continued success. And you know, with that, I'll just say I'm looking forward to the work ahead. Thank you. Hey, Jennifer, we're glad that you're here. Not to put you on a spot, would you like to say anything? I'm super proud and excited for him and excited for this new chapter in my life. Very good. And I think we have some representatives from Eastview, and we have some from Fayette Central, and it's uh, very nice that you're here to show support to Mr. Small. Anyone else want to make a comment or other we can say welcome? Thank you very okay. much. Okay. With that being said, uh, you guys can stick around for the rest or if you want to leave, that's your choice too. A couple of other items of business to take care of. <laughs> So tell her we should out one at a time. All right, moving on to the next item. Uh, we have a permission to submit the school corporation waiver form from implement implementation of protected taxes. Um, Ms. Tollett, would you take over Thank please for that? Um, the legislature during this last season uh, passed legislation that um, allows for school corporations the opportunity to def defer the implementation of the protected taxes their, imp their circuit breaker impact being diverted to non-protected funds, which for us are Transportation and Capital Projects Fund. If the impact to the Transportation Fund would be in excess of 10%. So what we're asking you to do this evening is approve this waiver to defer that implementation so that each fund accepts its appropriate share of the circuit breaker impact um, for 2014. We, if we would choose to do that again in 15 and 16, which is the amount of time the legislation allows for, we would need to bring that back each year. But that keeps um, debt service and pension debt sharing in their share of the, re, the circuit breaker impact. Um, 
if, if you choose not to do that, all of the circuit breaker that they might have shared will then be pushed to capital projects, transportation, and bus replacement <coughs> on a proportionate share. And as you all well know, we um, have very limited capital projects funds the way they are. So I'm asking for you to approve my submission of the documents whereby we are requesting the waiver. Okay, do you have any questions at this point? <coughs> Concerns? I move to approve the request. Okay, Mr. Hilton. I move that we approve the request. Do I hear a second? I'll second that. Okay, Mr. Hunt. <coughs> uh, seconds. Again, any questions or concerns? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? And the motion carries. Okay, the next item is the uh, Connorsville High School one-to-one -one iPad initiative. Uh, Dr. Riki. Thank you, Mr. Burchett. Board, uh, Dr. Hodges. Uh, earlier this week, we were given a couple of um, planning papers that we've been working diligently on since our March regular board meeting, where we were able to share with you our vision for one-to-one -one technology branching out in our Fayette County schools. The high school is our initial starting point with this endeavor, and we wanted to be able to provide you um, some more information in showing the thought process that's gone into this, um, because we want to make sure whatever we put forward, we are able to support and sustain. So, um, so to begin with, I'll give a, a, just, a, just a brief on the, the first document that you have on some of the big items that it's going to take to make, move this forward. Um, and Mrs. <coughs> Colin Pollock will talk a little bit about the finances. She, we've already shared this with the Finance Committee, and she's going to um, hit some of the highlights of that. And then Mr. Miller is here as um, what affects and can share some of the um, things on the last page that you have in reference to the technology department, what this looks like. But on the first um, page there, some of the big things that we know we need to do to make this work, um, we have to revise our current policies so that it allows students to have devices on a regular basis. Um, we're going to enter in through with textbook adoption a blended learning piece where we're going to have digital resources, not all traditional textbooks, that opportunity for students, although we know blended because we're not ready to let go of the book yet. So we can buy class sets of textbooks and have that reference if needed as we train students and teachers to use the digital resources that actually go way beyond the textbook. But it does include that textbook resource. Starting with English language arts because this is the year of their adoption. And then transitioning the other subjects with those resources. But of course there's so many free resources out there that they can start using the technology when the teacher and the students are ready. Um, we also are purchasing um, and making sure all staff have iPads. They currently, Randy, I believe, do they all have iPads currently at the, at the high school? Uh, Not all of them, but a, a lot of them do. We've been looking for pockets of money to supply that because we know that teacher training is critical and they need to have time to use the device. Um, also, then, the high school, we have to make sure the students get those devices for their learning, and um, that'll be forward using the textbook adoption, some QZAB dollars, which is explained there. Um, prime time is because the QZAB is helping us take some of the burden off of textbook rental from parents, and so the timing is perfect for us right now um, with those resources. One of the things that we know from our research that we need to put in place is an e-learning coach. Um, we've been delving into literacy coaches at the elementary, some math lead teachers, and at the high school we've um, expanded using our department chairs in English language arts and mathematics. A coach meaning that they're helping the general ed teachers learn the Common Core standards, the good instructional practices, and they're supporting them with research-based things for how students learn. Technology is no exception. Where it's been most successful is there's an e-learning coach that goes in place that has the time to really delve into the training, help the teacher deploy it to students. So they'll go into the classroom, they'll teach, co-teach with them, they'll be there in case a student can't get on or something's not working right. But the success is the teachers being risk takers knowing that there's another adult in the room that can help me get through it when it isn't working properly. 
Um, they also have an opportunity for that focused learning on the, the new resources coming out and then to train our teachers with that so they can go and get additional training. Very important part, it's new to us um, and uh, we've explored um, and studied what what characteristics it takes for that person and we're, we're hoping that after this is approved I, as I um, know you are very much supportive of this we would like to move forward with um, filling that position for next school year at the high school and middle school. Um, also with this the recommendation based on um, throughout the state of a non-certified staff to support the devices we have a fairly small technology department. The ratio that they recommend is a 1 to 250 device um, non-certified staff for support. Um, Mr. Miller will address this a little bit more in depth, but we have some creative ideas of how we might be able to increase our non-certified staff using some collegiate um, students in, in part-time positions and things like that. So we may not reach it initially, but that would be a goal that we could um, make sure we have enough supporting staff to deploy the machines, set them up, if we have to make a trade-in because one needs to be fixed, so we can do a lot of our own repairs with some additional training from that staff, and making sure that we're, we're full, that we don't have kids sitting in classrooms without the device because it's sitting isolate and broken someplace. Um, also the professional development, very critical, and it's ongoing. Um, I was at an e-learning workshop all day yesterday, and by one o'clock I was overwhelmed, I was ready to cry, I said I got so much more to learn, and it's, and, it's, and it's just a process and you have to keep going back and, and, and working with your colleagues and training each other. It's very much teacher training teacher, but we have to get some of that professional piece at the beginning too. Um, we also need professional training for the technology staff. They're going to be learning things and it's constantly changing. They have to keep up. They have to keep up with what are those best devices and those apps that um, support learning. <coughs> Uh, the responsible use policy is something we talked about. I, we're no longer going to need a policy of when they can use them. Is they're going to have them and they're going to use them, but what's, what are those things that they need to know is the proper way to use those devices? So it's language changing, but it's something that's needed. Otherwise, our current policy wouldn't support this type of learning. Um, and then, of course, we have to realign our student registration process because this is going to involve parents and students renting a device for a school year so that they can take it home and they can take care of it but they can also learn from it 24 7 even after they learn school so that's new to us and so we have to re redesign that process and make sure that um, everyone understands you know what's the proper way to you know use the device keep the updates update device updated and um, and what kind of cloud we're going to use for which kind of class and, and all of those interesting features so, Janie, you want to share a little bit about the finances highlights? Sure. Um, in the packet that was given to you tonight, there's a little more beefed up and has some additional documents in it besides the narrative. The second page in that walks through um, the financial piece that Dr. Riki spoke about that was limited to the QZAB and the textbook rental. Under the proposal, um, 1,100 iPads would be purchased and we would be doing a split of the cost of those. 60% would come from the QZAB and 40% of the cost would come from textbook rental. The logic behind that is you cannot charge textbook rental uh, for anything that's not been purchased with textbook rental. So this allows us to charge a small amount of textbook rental to the students or the students' parents for the use of these iPads each year. It would be about $38 based on the cost of the iPads that we're talking about. What that does is it helps us build a little capacity for the replacement in the next generation of these um, digital learning devices should the school corporation need to be the one providing them. <coughs> Additionally, as you move down the list, you'll see other items that are being recommended, you know, cases for the iPads, some teacher, the teacher iPads that Dr. Riki spoke about. Um, we did purchase a 100 iPads last year that are an older generation. 
because we used QZAB funds, they cannot be automatically redeployed at another location. So what's going to happen is um, Mr. Miller will use local or grant funds to cover uh, $45,800 of the cost that those iPads cost us of the purchase of these new iPads and then the, basically he's buying them at full cost from us to redeploy in another location. So he's restoring the money to the QZAP program. So the net cost of all of these items to the QZAP is about 300000 If you go down the column, you'll look at this um, page, you'll see 297000 Uncommitted for technology in the QZAP, we currently have 455000 which leaves 157000 for the virtualization that um, Mr. Miller will speak about a little bit later in the program. Those, those funds were earmarked early, actually, um, with the anticipation of doing that during the last school year. It, we knew that we needed to do that. It's really kind of independent from this iPad but it, it was part of the QZAP. So the next page speaks to uh, the charge, the textbook rental piece, the $38 that will be charged each year for five years. 45% uh, of our population is non-free and reduced lunch, so they would pay the full cost. 55% qualify for free and reduced lunch. Therefore, the state will only reimburse us $30.32 per iPad. So, um, we'll get a little bit back over the next five years. I also want to point out, when you get down to the next generation, um, should we continue this digital learning, the high school will still not have enough resources built up to sustain this program on their own and we will likely need to offer them um, another loan or additional support during the first few years if everything would be equal and we would continue this beyond the first five years. So um, what we're proposing for this purchase, the high school does not have enough in their textbook rental fund. Textbook rental can be at the building level or at the corporation level. So we are recommending that from the corporation funds we establish a textbook rental fund that would then show in the monthly report that you receive from me. We would pay the $166,760 out of that fund here at the corporation level. However, the high school would reimburse us over the next five years a portion of that loan and, and by the end of the five years they would have it all repaid. That's on the next page. Um, the, the, we are not supposed to run funds in the red, however this is the only way to potentially accomplish this and still be able to charge textbook rental with the um, portion needing to be paid from textbook rental funds in order to be able to charge the textbook rental. <coughs> so, um, I think, Terry, do you want to speak about your part in the staffing notes? At the end is a summary sheet that kind of um, shows all of the things that we are talking about this evening. Very brief descriptions down the left hand side. Along the top are the funding sources and it summarizes where we have pocketed each one of these monies. So, okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Additional technology will be implemented at the high school is coming summer as well. It, uh, they are planned events. 
Uh, they've been planned for some time to the extent that some capital project funds uh, from 2013 were encumbered in preparation for uh, these projects coming up, as well as uh, as pointed out that we have also had some projects aligned with the, uh, the QZAB funding and complementing that with these comp uh, with the uh, capital projects fundings to do these the nature of these uh, uh, particular projects are such that we want to be sure that we're communicating with you and moving forward because we are talking about some significant items the uh, the equipment that we're looking at comes through the <coughs> quantity purchasing quantity purchase agreements through the state of Indiana thus removing our dependency on uh, getting bids in that particular set, uh, circumstances for that equipment. We're just taking advantage of already established pricing that's available through the quantity purchase agreement negotiated between the, the vendors and the state of Indiana. Um, <clears throat> in addition to the, the hardware, uh, we will, of course, with additional devices coming in, we'll be having larger demands for internet bandwidth, internet connectivity. And the recommendation is uh, 100 megabit per second con uh, connection for every 1,000 students. Today, uh, our connection is for the entire corporation is 50 megabit per second. And uh, within the, the uh, parameters of what we've already outlined in capital projects, we want to move that forward to uh, uh, up to 200 megabit per second connection. Um, in addition to the increase in bandwidth and speed, we're looking at creating uh, diversity in our connection to the internet. This past winter took its toll on us uh, with uh, damaged fiber, and we identified that single point of failure, and we'll be looking to diverse our relationship on our internet connectivity such that we'll have two pathways that complement together and make <coughs> our entire bandwidth. So if we have a problem with like one, We've significantly reduced our risk uh, on our connectivity by having the other. In the case of upcoming uh, high stakes testing, it, it also gives us assurance that we're going to provide the services needed in order to accomplish assessments like ISTEP and other assessments that transpire throughout the year. Um, <clears throat> as pointed out, the one to the one to one <coughs> talks about a ratio of one technical support person for every 250 devices. To complement that, we're looking to take one of our current uh, part-time technology educational assistants and move his role into a full-time 261-day employee. And uh, that's within the, the context of eliminating that educational assistant role, as well as uh, eliminating some of the summer internship, role, uh, summer internship programs that we have and that all falls within a uh, realm of the capital projects, uh, plus or minus, as pointed out, I think uh, 30, $3,800. Do you want to touch on the... Um yeah, part-time um, piece with that because that is part of it too, right? Okay. Right. On 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 the, the one to two fifty ratio is is that what you're referring to? I'll make sure I've understood. Your I point. believe so. Okay. What we're looking to there is uh, there are various outlets <coughs> to try to uh, reach out <coughs> to those who are attending colleges, technical schools. You know, an ideal candidate would be someone who's. Uh, maybe attending uh, one of the colleges and universities in the Richmond area that lives in Connorsville, find a way to, you know, uh, bring in those skilled resources. There is, um, and Dr. Bears uh, made me aware of in the past, there's an Indiana intern net uh, site that we want to uh, make a, uh, an option available and get postings out there. and and try to find some, and solicit some, some potential quality candidates. I've also been speaking with the Career Center about recent graduates or upcoming graduates of individuals that would want to 
uh, take a look at or take advantage of that particular opportunity as well, as well as some general conversation with some of the high school teachers that uh, if they uh, recognize a particular student that would fall within uh, qualifications and, and career pursuit that they're interested in. So we're getting, we're kind of getting the word of mouth out, trying to construct the type of resource that we want. That particular, uh, those particular resources uh, would be uh, flexing their schedule such that we're able to provide support above and beyond just the regular school day. So we may be having opportunities of uh, labs open after school and this person would be a, 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 a in the lab go-to resource to assist students and same time deal with any device problems or issues that come along and flexing their schedules uh, throughout the course of a you know an extended day thank you just any questions for any of us and I know you've had an opportunity to read and now you've heard more it's, it's complicated and it's comprehensive but um, our students deserve you know moving forward with this and we're willing to put the effort behind it and work the creative finances to make it work so we just need your um, approval to you know move forward and carry the vision out at this point so so is this only going to be used in English classes then oh, good question um, the answer to that is no because the students will have the device with them all day we already have social studies classes math classes we have different pockets of teachers that are already using the devices and learning more about them um, and we have uh, even with the middle school they're using them but they have a cart of them so they already had the carts and they were getting experience this year it just wasn't where it stayed with the student so the student can put their work on them and or to use them to do their uh, projects or go to my big campus and upload like you saw demonstrated the last board meeting there where the students were using those devices etc at home so it carries the, the learning beyond the <coughs> with the funds you know we're really trying to be conscientious with the funds so we're focusing on language language arts staff first and prioritizing the training if we like when Apple comes in to do a training there's 20 20 members and we can do repeated training but we probably can't do the whole staff so this allows us to have a vision towards English language arts because we know those teachers are going to have digital resources based on the textbook adoption so it's not like you can have a perhaps the math teachers come in they may not have the resources quite available to them yet or they have to find free resources out there so by using English language arts as our starting point and then just building on those of high interest the teachers that are ready for that next move it gives us an opportunity to work with a critical mass of people and not the whole staff and then they'll become trainers of others and it'll grow it's I think it's good to start with a focus especially when your monies are limited and your time is limited so they can carry it all all day long in every class period and I know <coughs> Randy has done some experimental things with the smartphones and the clickers and those types of things well they'll, the teachers will know the students are coming in with a device so they may choose to have them um, do something with that pull up my big campus right there in class download their homework you know as they're finishing it and use those but as far as are we going to demand or require everyone at this point no or not it's a slow process so we're going to try to use our e-learning coach very strongly in English language arts and then and then grow it from there. Part of it has to marry up with the textbook adoption schedule mm -hmm. because you don't adopt all books in one year. Right. And English language art, arts is this year and almost if not all students have English language arts. So that makes this the premier year. And next year I believe is history or social science, studies. science social, studies. social studies so you're going to tap a large part of those kids so we won't adopt a traditional textbook for them their textbook will become an online textbook and then the year after that is science so we'll phase out that science text and move to this they'll still be able to use it like Kathy said for other things but part of it is to bring those layers in as the adoptions come up because we can't afford to buy digital curriculum when the textbooks that were bought last time aren't paid for and you need it to go through that full cycle before you've got the money 
to then replace them. So, so each year that another subject is um, put into places, are going to be need to be more employees for each subject and all that to tech well, services and all that each year. The, if our enrollment grows, yes. If our enrollment stays steady, we're already trying to go to for the 1,100 students. Mm -hmm. Um, if we bring on the middle school, which we will be on, then, then we'll have to revisit it. And ideally, some of the part-time employees will want to stay with us. And then we can make maybe a full-time employee, et cetera. So um, something else it comes, you know, something else gives, but we have to prioritize where the staffing needs are. And we don't even know the, all the answers to that because we're still learning, um, you know, what that might look like. But, you, you know, we, we need to support it, but we, we're not going to be at 1 to 250, and, but that's okay. We're okay starting a not quite there. Okay. And how can the teachers control if the students are staying on task, if they're on what they're supposed to be on with these devices? Because the teacher can't see <coughs> everyone. Part of the investment in the professional development for my team is going to be learning how to establish the devices so that they're um, supervised. And that supervision <coughs> is going to be uh, defined by a set of requirements or requirements that we want to, or features or functions we want to remove. For instance, the app store, that will not be available to the students, so they can't go out and make app purchases. We will manage the devices so that they're also, because they're a district-owned device, they have to be compliant with the Child Internet Protection Act, otherwise we put our E-rate funding at risk. So we have to have um, certain parameters in place just because of our responsibilities of those devices. Um, the other aspect is, you know, the teachers themselves have got to get through their professional development so they can begin to feel comfortable with the devices and begin to recognize what is good behavior in this setting. Some of it can be as straightforward as, um, you know, turn your device over, you know, while we're doing this particular task, we, you know, there's no reason for you to be on your device at this particular time. Um, there are other mechanisms that they'll learn that, that deal with how to address their classroom in that environment. Um, I, I frequently <coughs> said, as, as we've gone through this, I wish I had the crystal ball to answer every aspect of this. Some of this is going to be a learning process for us too, and we're going to have to make adjustments uh, as we go along, as districts who have also done this, uh, you know, in their in their second or third year of this, they're always revisiting. Okay, what didn't work? Let's go back <coughs> and be sure we're addressing the aspects. You know, do a post mortem on things and, and make sure we're addressing that aspect. Additional, uh, the e-learning coach position is going to be very crucial to you know that type of surveying or canvassing the environment and and providing the feedback we need in technology to address any of those, you know, glaring issues. But I will point out, and, and Mr. Judd and I have had conversation, you know, discipline issues are going to still continue to exist, but we're probably shifting them from one collection of uh, challenges just to a different arena of challenges. The other part of that is, if, if you recall with elementary in their first 20 days, and James, you can chat, chat time at any time, there's a specific uh, procedures that they teach, you know, just how to do school, you know, what's proper proper way to walk down the hallway, and when do you go to use the restroom, and there's a lot of procedures they tie it into literacy, even in the, the, the balanced literacy program they have, there's, there's actually 30 days, and that's growing their knowledge and their background knowledge of what this literacy is going to look like, and there's, there's procedures in place. It might be a little more unique to the high school to have a systematic piece of procedures, so like the, you know, one teacher will have these procedures and another one will have another. When you have a device that's common, <coughs> there are things that are appropriate and there's things that are not appropriate, and we have to explicitly teach those in the first few days of school every year, and then you have to revisit them to make sure, check for understanding, make sure the students understand what's allowed and what's not allowed. So that is something we have to put in our repertoire and we have to, with the coaching, but also explicit the training of the teachers, that's part of it. So there's certain things that the entire staff will have to be involved in just so that they understand what's allowed and what's not. And that's part of that policy language too. The policy language is addressed and speaks to us now in the digital language, 
then we'll know how to follow it and we'll know what the expectations are. So we can discipline because they have been trained. Um, they sign off on the internet policy already, but do we have anybody that abuses it? We absolutely do, but we have a records and we have a practice of uh, procedures to take care of that and, and to discipline that. So we like to be optimistic. It's a risk we're willing to take because our students deserve, all the ones who will follow it, they deserve to have that opportunity. I do I want to talk the about the e-learning coach for a minute and point one thing out specifically. That is being paid from a federal grant that we've received. It's been budgeted for this year. So um, the expectation would be is that position will be, po if this is approved to move forward, it will be posted in-house only first to see if we have in-house interest. Then the person who might be moving to that position from in-house if we would need to fill their probably general fund funded position, that position would be placed on a temporary contract because um, either a position paid from a grant or a person replacing an, an individual paid from a grant qualifies for the use of a temporary contract. So in the event we do not get to script next year and could not continue the e-learning coach and we could not find somewhere else some other grant funds to pay from that from that person who moved into that position would have the right to go back to the classroom and the temporary contract would fall off so we're not committing ourselves to this position and then replacing someone else and then you've got extra staff you do have a back door to get out of that if we don't have a funding source for the e-learning coach that would come from grant proceeds the first year. So, Going back, the way I understood to the controlling issue is you can't put, the students can't put whatever they want on those iPads. You control programs that can be put on there. So they can't put Facebook and they can't put YouTube and all of those Twitters and all is Can that they get correct? On the regular internet though. Now the devices, the term used is supervised. The Apple term mm -hmm. is is supervised, and once they're supervised, um, we control the experience on that device. We control what apps can go on that device. Uh, if they try to tether their iPad to their home computer. It comes up and it tells them this is a supervised device. You can't do anything with this. I but they can't get on the internet. That. She asked, yeah, that's "Can what they I ask, get, can on get on the, on the internet?" internet. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's. Oh, what I'm sorry. I thought you meant getting app applications. No, from they the could, You know, the teachers in the front of the class. Here they are. They're doing whatever they want. She, you know. That's well, the other concern. aspects. That's a teacher problem. <coughs> well, the well, other that's aspects. A problem. No, no, there's too many to watch, though. Yeah. There's too many to watch. One of the other aspects is we still have to provide that Child Internet Protection Act compliant device, mm -hmm. which means wherever that device is, uh, it has to go through our web filter. So if they're if they're at a, a, a Wi-Fi hotspot somewhere in town, or they have internet at home, they still will be coming through our web filter and it controls the content that they are able to, to view and search and uh, assures that you know it's as best as possible uh, for educational purposes. So they do have internet access on the devices, but it's still going to be a <coughs> continuing experience that filters their content. I had one question that's kind of been in my mind, and maybe it's been covered but okay this first year we're purchasing 1100 at what was it three hundred and seventy nine dollars or something like that special uh, price from Apple but let's suppose at the end of the first year we had a hundred I'm just pulling a number hundred of them that are broken lost and we go to replace those are we still going to get those for 379 or what's going to happen when we go to purchase to replace the 379 price point is uh, been for the last two years uh, the education discounted uh, price for the iPads that uh, Apple's identified that that is the price point that they're offering these devices at for education uh, again I wish I had the crystal ball right. to tell you that that's it but our experience is that's where we've been for two years <coughs> 
and uh, the latest generation of device that they came out for education fell at the exact same price point again at 379 so our expectations is we'll still continue to see that price point. Piggyback what he mentioned as far as the loss, are these school devices allowed to have an embedded GPS device on them? You know, this thing, I, you know, I get skeptical if some student try to sell it or, you know, try to, you know, the freedom to take them home, that's something that always crosses my mind. Is, I don't mm -hmm. know if that's allowed to be on them or whether they be equipped with that. Um, they are equipped with uh, position tracking and, and locating. Uh, they do have that. Um, it uh, also allows us in those instances to lock the device and, and would, no matter where it's at, lock the device or wipe the device or both. Um, <clears throat> it, that takes advantage of a particular uh, system called a mobile device management, which, uh, as previously mentioned, we had 100 iPads come in this year, and uh, we have those in the map. You know, we, we have an experience with that mobile device management. We're able to track the positions, and if the device is actually, I have those coded such that if they leave the high school campus, I get an email alert. Um, we won't necessarily be looking at, at something as restrictive as the high school campus uh, with, with this initiative, but uh, we do take advantage and track those devices where they're located. One thing I learned yesterday that was interesting at the e-learning workshop is one corporation has them take a, they have little cameras on them, so they take a picture of, of them and that's their home page. That's, so when you find one, you, open, you turn it on and you see whose it is by the face that's on the home page of the iPad. Little things like that, I mean people are learning tricks of making, you know, to help manage it. We're still learning and we'll, you know, we'll learn together, but there's a lot of help out there. People that have already been doing this for three years. A lot of corporations doing this already, you know, we're just getting started, so. And I think that was one of the things I was going to say, and, 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 and I've, I've, I've told you all where I'm from, and I will tell you a presentation from a school from near where I grew up that, that had just the issue that you were talking about, that people were, were, were taking those laptops at that time and, and recycling them, and they ended up who, know, who knows where. There's been a lot of things happen that we've learned from that. This is brand new for us. It's not brand new to the education. We are not bleeding edge. We're not even cutting edge. So there's a lot of things that, that other schools have learned by doing that we don't have to repeat their mistakes. That's, that's the good thing. We, we have a window of opportunity with our QZAP, with our English adoption, to start down this path. Uh, if we let this window of opportunity close, there will be another one. I'm just not sure how soon that, that will be. Uh, as, a, as, as has been mentioned, there are a number of, of schools across the state that, that are, are ahead of us in the area of technology. And this is an opportunity for us to uh, help our students be, uh, become more competitive with, with students of, of similar age as they, as they prepare. I hate to use the, the phrase, but as, as we try to help them become uh, college and career ready, uh, we're, we're playing a little bit of catch up when it comes to the technology area. So I, I appreciate the work that has been done. It's, it's a huge commitment. Um, we don't have all of the answers, uh, but, but we're, not, we're, not, we're not the first one to do this. And so we, there are resources out there to help us when we run into, run into issues. This is going to be a huge cost. Do you have any idea what kind of cost this is going to be? If you look at the last page, um, of the documents that I have put at your place this evening. This is just a very generic description down the left hand side and then each of the items that have been discussed and what the cost is and where it will be paid from on um, so the if um, if you look, the first column is the QZAM. The second column is identified as carryover capital projects. And that is, are some smaller items related to printers, whiteboard, staff replacements. Um, but if you look down under the virtualization, 
that's where the larger numbers are. Uh, because those projects didn't occur during last calendar year and we had them budgeted for or monies identified for them, Terry and I encumber those. So when it says carryover, all of that is money that was um, put in the 2013 CPF that we encumbered, we are able to encumber and roll forward to 14. So that's old money. Then the capital projects column that doesn't say carryover is a new commitment from the capital projects fund. The next column is the CHXS textbook account, which is the actual digital curriculum, curriculum or the English textbook that would be adopted under this. <coughs> um, and the column after that is textbook corporation, which would be where we're asking to loan the high school the money for the 40% of the cost of the iPads. Then you get into the federal grants, the Title II monies are identified for professional development for staff. Then the rural, in, uh, rural and low income grant paying for the e-learning coach for secondary. And then the last column would be the commitment from um, local rainy day funds, which is uh, limited to an estimate of maybe what might be left over um, from the e-learning coach if the grant doesn't pay for it all, not knowing who might take that position and where they would fall on the salary schedule. Um, the increased part-time technology support that we're asking for, which would be, we hope to be those maybe college students working five hours a day, 220 days a year, no benefits, nothing like that. That would come from rainy day. And then all the way down at the bottom would be um, the amount of the commitment of the change within the technology department's staffing and how the asking to move the part-time educational assistant to a full-time technology um, technician. So this right here kind of summarizes it. Um, a lot of them are one-time expenditures, and then you get out to the rainy day, that will be annualized expenditures. The capital projects, the increased internet speed would be an annual commitment also. So the rainy day fund, what's listed here will come out every year then for these? For, because it's funding for positions, correct? Well, unless the e-learning coach doesn't cost us that much, then there wouldn't be anything to come out of there. But because we don't know who's going to get that um, position, we just took, I think I took an M12 or an M13 that was already on staff that had family insurance, made a projection of all of the benefits associated with that to project what that cost was subtracted off the amount of the federal grant to, came to, a, to come to a residual amount. <clears throat> okay, do you have any other questions or concerns? then I assume we are ready to uh, move on what we want to do. So, what is your pleasure, Board, concerning the one-to-one -one iPad initiative? Mr. Burchett? Yes. There, if it's the Board's pleasure to proceed with this, there are several things that I believe specifically need to be identified that you're approving. That would be the iPad purchase using QZAB and textbook rental funds. The loan to CHS for the textbook rental piece to be repaid over five years. <clears throat> the e-learning coach position.
the part-time technology support staff with no benefits as presented. The current educational assistant moving to full-time computer technician. Current part-time to full-time, is that what you said? Current, current part-time educational assistant to full-time computer technician position. And then the expenditures needed for the virtualization desk desktop infrastructure utilizing the state QPA. And the reason for that is because of the size of some of the purchases, the loan component, the personnel piece, and um, taking advantage of the state QPA. So. Okay, help me on that last one again. You threw a lot of words at me. I'm there. sorry. Expenditures needed for the virtualization desktop infrastructure. Am I saying that correctly? Okay. Utilizing the state of Indiana QPA. QPA? QPA. It's, it's a quantity purchasing agreement through the state. It keeps us from having to bid these projects because they've already bid on behalf of any governmental entity in the state of Indiana that wishes to take advantage of it, just like we did for the um, truck purchase that we made uh, last year. So yeah, any all of that can be one, made or portion of it, but those are the items that I believe would require action because the personnel, large finance, and the loan. So we actually need six motions is what we're boiling well, down like to. It could be bundled but, into one, okay. it, 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 but those items are the ones that need to be addressed. I, I don't, if the pleasure is to proceed with all of them then you know somebody can make the motion I recommend we to recommend to all of them in the one motion yes. then. and then we'll okay. work with Cindy to make sure it's it says what it's supposed to say so that it gets okay. it meets their day. It's hard to get all this down okay with that being said are there any questions or comments I just think this is a huge amount of money to spend on something like this right now you know, we're short on funds for so many of the funding and everything, and this is huge to take on, I think. So, you know, I don't know at this point if, if you know, we're ready for it financially, you know, so. What's Mr. Judd think about it? You're going to be, you're going to be right, right in the pack. I'm all for it. I think it's the thing to do. We've had a board that's been very progressive in the past for our one-to-one -one initiative. Those machines are old, probably not even close to being state-of-the-art technology. Probably uh, They probably never were when we purchased them. And uh, if, if we want to give our kids the education that's going to help them be a success in the world as we know, and, we, and I talked about this the last time we were here, we need to teach them how to use these devices and that's that's the way book companies are going. Uh, I would say in five years there will be no paper books. It will all be digital. And the reps are telling us that right now there's really only two book companies. They've all consolidated. They've purchased the smaller companies. And uh, they're telling us that this may be the last time they print books for a lot of subjects. <coughs> Do you want to speak to the staff survey? Thank you. Oh, well, I, last time I was here I told you that the staff was 94% in favor of it. There were two staff members that um, thought that they didn't want to use that technology in their classroom, but I can tell you that one of those staff members, even though it was a, a non-identifiable survey, uh, I knew who it was by the department they were in, and I can tell you that the staff member was at an in-service on Monday. Mrs. Geeston gave an in-service to some teachers on how to use some word processing things and uh, uh, allow students to take notes and that teacher was excited he said I need my own iPad I want to do this so I 
I think we have a very sizable rainy day fund. I think we have a very sizable general fund. And uh, I think over the years as we pay this back, that we'll be glad that we chose this route at this point. One thing I'd like to add is if I had this type of learning available to me, I think I'd really be smart, a lot smarter than I currently am. We're not talking about the same kind of way we learned. And it's very hard for us as mature adults to, to, to figure out how is this going to be different? What's the outcome going to be different than when I went to school with a book? The books are like dissolving in front of us because the information is too old for us even. We're supposed to keep them for six years. That's not the way the books operate anymore. They're constantly changing. They're dynamic. The expectations are dynamic. Standards change, no big deal. We upgrade our software so that now you are up to speed. The support that teachers get, they are um, given assessments to check for understanding on a regular basis. Those assessments are not like the old multiple choice assessments. They are called drag and drop and they have multiple choice selection. The, where the I step, where the ECAs are going things that you and I didn't have to do. Um, the writing and from the Common Core Standards, those pieces are, they can be scored electronically with our textbooks. We don't have to wait for the big thing. So we, the kids write these, they submit them, and they're electronically scored and come back with rubric scores. So what we're able to expose our students to is going to advance their thinking, their learning, their outcome. We're going to finally have the opportunity to support them to get college and career ready. Without this, um, it's going to be very difficult and we will fall further behind um, it, and that's just my, my, my true belief and I'm not just saying because I, I, I you know, love technology, I'm so learner, I'm a, I'm a very beginning a learner for, compared to some of the kids, but I'm passionate about making sure Fayette County kids are supported with this type of learning. Our teachers are ready. That's the hardest sell is your teachers. They, you know, it's, it's more work for them and difficult, but it's contagious once they see the kids learning and what the kids output and how they're starting to read and write and talk. Um, and they can take it beyond the classroom walls. So I personally, when I look at the figures and knowing that creative financing over there has figured out, we've got this paid for, QZAB is going to expire and we're going to have to spend it on something. I think our thought is this is probably the best value for those dollars that we have in the QZAB. Um, and fortunately, as Randy said, there is some rainy day fund to help with that two to two fifty to one ratio, one to two fifty ratio. Um, I I think that's why we're working as a team with this. We we value this, and um, we think our students deserve it. And I think our teachers will grow, and we'll all be better off as a community. <coughs> because. To uh, piggyback on the comment, our I uh, heard about. Uh, pretty much school systems have it and they pretty much worked all the bugs out of it. Last fall I went to a, um, a school board seminar and I specifically went to a class or some training on school systems that are using the iPads and I remember I remember distinctly the presentations on three school systems that have it here in Indiana. I'm sure they had bugs in it with those things that they had pretty much worked out. And I remember one of the questions of the crowd, and all three of them said they would never want to go back to pre-iPad days. They were, they were so on it, and they, they had some of the same, I'm sure school boards had the concerns, but I remember them specifically talking about the high points, very few low points, and it's just, just put their children just ahead of the curve, and I'm, I'm to them in technology. Not junky, but... And that's what sold me on it, you know, just listening in that presentation and looking at the statistics and, so, and they talked over the problems, and, you know. So are you ready for a motion, Mr. President? I am, if there's no further discussion. Uh, I'd like to make a motion that we pursue this to include those six caveats that Mrs. Kellen Tall brought to our attention. Okay, the motion has been made and include those six items as uh, outlined. Do I hear a second? Second. Mr. Jones seconds. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? No. Okay. Uh, six and one. And the motion uh, carries. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Do I hear a second? 
second the motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Are the meeting is adjourned and the motion carries. <laughs>